what mm-hmm. were Kierkegaard's views on repetition? Because, of course, that's quite similar or, or not similar, but that but it definitely ties into the idea of eternal recurrence. And I did get another question yeah. about kind of the two yeah. ideas. What, how would you, firstly, how would you summarize what um, Kierkegaard viewed on repetition? What was it? And, and of mm-hmm. course, this latter question is how does it tie in with eternal recurrence? Yeah, so uh, repetition is an idea that really only appears technically in one Mm -hmm. book um, published 1843 um, Mm -hmm. alongside Fear and Trembling, Mm -hmm. uh, written by a pseudonym, um, Constantin Constantinus. And, Mm -hmm. um, of course, his his names are always compelling and they're intentional, you know, so repetition is written by a guy whose name is Constancy, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. The, The perpetual Constancy. Um, In this book, what Kierkegaard is doing is trying to think about the inevitable tragedy that we face when we realize our lives are always only lived in the present that disappears. So he's really kind of engaging a complicated question in, uh, we might say, sort of analytic philosophy of time. How is it we exist when the moment in which we exist is always ever receding into the past. And yet that towards which we strive is always never yet here. Right. Mm. This is a kind of tragic awareness of the um, existence of what temporality means to meaning making. Mm. So in this text, what we find Kierkegaard do is tells this story um, about a young man who is taking a trip back to, you know, a a place he had been going back to Germany, back to Berlin, etc. And in doing this, Kierkegaard is inviting us into the realization that there is a temptation, remember the aesthetic, there's this temptation to avoid boredom by always having a new thing, right? Mm. The problem is, what did we see was the problem with that mode of living it's what he calls the despair of losing our selfhood in relation to always trying to get our selfhood via mm-hmm. some other thing. So the image he gives here is of crop rotation. So I'm actually right now um, a UK reference. I'm, I'm watching um, the Amazon Prime series Clark, uh, Clarkson's Farm, second, mm-hmm. uh, second round, which cracks me up. My son and I watch it together and it, it's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> but it's so interesting when you watch this. Everything that Jeremy Clarkson is doing being a farmer is constantly having to basically do again the thing that he's already done, right? You planted barley. Well, now you harvest the barley and you got to till the soil to lay the fertilizer to plant the barley so that you can harvest the barley so that you can till the soil. So like, and the boredom of this is sort of, you know, pretty present, right? We can see how, God, what a miserable existence. Um, it's what David Foster Wallace talks about in his amazing book, This is Water, where he says adult existence, something that you college students will never understand, he says, until you're an adult, like until you're really in it. It's absolutely horrifyingly, exhaustingly mundane and dull. Mm. And the reason is we get out of bed to do a thing so that we can do a different thing so we can come home and eat dinner to go to bed to get up and do the same thing again the next day. And if we're really lucky, we get to keep doing that for about 40 years so we can retire and maybe do something different. Mm. Like, welcome to, you know, capitalistic adulthood, right? So when we understand that the aesthetic despair is a despair of constantly having to change things up to make us forget how bored we are, that's why it's called crop rotation, Hey, planted Mm -hmm. barley. Now let's do wheat. Hey, now let's do corn. Now let's do something, right? Now it's not just the same thing. I'm doing all these different things every time. The problem is if we are always engaged in that rotation process, we're also now constantly losing ourselves because there is no constancy to our selfhood, right? Mm -hmm. I am, influencer culture models this, right? I just am whatever I get enough likes to say about myself. Mm. And, you know, you maybe have done this. I don't know where you'll like post something on social media and it doesn't get enough likes in like the first half hour and you start second guessing yourself. And so you take it back down like, oh, shoot, maybe Mm. that was a bad thing to say. Maybe I don't really mean that. 
that idea is crop rotation. It's where we are actively trying to figure out who we are in relationship to what others are saying of us since we've got to have the new phone, the new car, the new thing. All right, so if we see that as the problem, well, then we now can understand what Constantine is wrestling with, Kierkegaard is wrestling with there in repetition, which is, it seems like the way I get out of the boring realities of repetition is just doing something different, always looking for the new, always looking for the novel. The problem with that is if I'm always looking for the novel, looking for the new, who is it that I am except as the self who's never actually myself, right? I'm Ooh. only myself by wanting something else, wanting to be different. And so this is the tension. On the one hand, we have boring misery of monotony, doing the same thing. On the other hand, we have the constancy of the new that actually leads to the despair of losing Ooh. myself in the process. How are we to make sense of it? And Kierkegaard says, well, <laughs> there are um, several good options that have been suggested in the history of philosophy, the most prominent of which is what Plato described as recollection. And recollection is where we basically live into the present, right? This fleeting razor's edge of a present. We live into the present by constantly remembering, bringing back to consciousness the stuff that we've done in the past. Mm. The problem here, of course, is then it's not clear how we are actually living into the task of selfhood. We're only ever remembering the self we were. Mm. So he says of recollection that it makes tons of sense to kind of get our bearings relative to our past, but it doesn't do a very good job of orienting us towards where we're moving in the direction mm. that we now are, are striving. But how could we go forward if not now to fall back into the aesthetic mm of despair yeah. right th this is the issue and he offers repetition as the way to make this work mm. repetition he says is recollection forwards mm. <laughs> so the the way to think about this is how is it that we are now able to anchor ourselves in what we've done in who we've been in our narrative how do okay. we anchor ourselves there in such a way that it is constantly a new opportunity to become who we want to have been. That's a mm. complicated uh, grammatical phrase. But I'll say it again. Repetition allows us to think intentionally about how we become who we will have want to have been. So the example um, Marilyn Piety gives is she talks about loving really, really nice fountain pens. And she says, you know, when I love the fountain pens that I've collected, it makes me want to go buy a new fountain pen, right? Which you've probably mm. all had that experience. You know, you love fishing, so you always want to go get the new rod, get the new reel, mm. get the yeah. new fly, the new whatever. <laughs> and the problem is, she says, if I'm always wanting the new, then I'm actually never the person who is celebrating and living into the joy of what it is that I have been. Like the, the pen that I bought five years ago actually really still matters. But the problem is mm. I'm ignoring its significance by trying to get a new pin all the time. Mm. And so yeah. she says, instead, repetition is not just recollecting, sitting there admiring my old pin, nor is it abandoning a concern for who I've been and just getting the new aesthetic crop rotation. Mm -hmm. It's instead an attempt to take seriously, how can I not go buy the new pin, but in my desire of the new pin, actually be even more impressed with the beauty of the one I've already got. How can I be more invested in the past precisely now as the active occurrence of joy in my present that orients me now more effectively toward my future? recollection forwards is we no longer abandon the necessity of living riskily forward into the future that is always mysterious and indeterminate. We embrace that risk, but we embrace that risk in light of anchoring ourselves in the faithfulness that we have done our best to enact on purpose, <laughs> right? So again, think my relation to my wife. 
Is it possible that marriage gets dull after 22 years? Of course, right? You, you've had the same conversation an awful lot of times. You've done the same stuff. You've gone out to dinner. You're like Eventually, it just becomes this temptation to monotony. However, in real faithfulness, where it's always becoming, always ever new, always ever, you know, what, what uh, we might describe as worthwhile, well, now, hey, Vanessa, let's go get dinner. Remember that place we went that was so amazing? We're now going maybe back to that same place, not just mm. to literally recreate what we had done, but to realize that having done that, having had dinner at that really neat place two years ago, whatever, actually informs the awesomeness that is the development that has occurred since we were there. So we don't just go to Berlin again. We actually now go back to Berlin or go back to that restaurant or go back to that pen or go back to that fly rod. We do these things precisely <coughs> as someone who has been shaped and grown and developed by that as part of our history. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's where repetition, I mean, again, it's a complicated idea. And so that's why it's important to kind of lay that out in relation to the eternal return. Uh, they, they are different ideas, but what I think, again, is the underlying current that they both hit on that I think is really cool is, are you okay saying yes to the choices that you make? Both are asking us that, right? Are you okay with who you've been as propelling you into who you're trying to become? That question is why when Nietzsche talks about the eternal return, you know, he has this basically demon show up and says, you've got to repeat everything you've ever done for all eternity. And then the question is, will you look at the demon and say, thou art a God, right? What would it look like to be okay in the perpetual groundhog day of repeating our existence over and over and over? Well, that's a question. Are you okay with the narrative you let be written? Are you able to will the meaning and significance of the life that you intentionally let become meaningful and significant, right? That's why when I say the only question for me is what's worthy of our finitude, that's not meant to be reductive or flippant. It's meant to say, give me any technical debate. And at some level, that technical, complicated, pro-level thing is reducing back to but are we every day making the most of the time that is limited? Mm. And the eternal return is a way of foisting that responsibility on us. It confronts mm. us. It throat punches us with the idea mm. that, hey, all right, are you okay with what today looks like? Mm. Could you do it forever? And you're like, oh, God, no. Like, I, I want to get out of university so I can do something else. But the point is, what makes the something else possible? Being in university. <laughs> so are you okay making the choice to be where you are on purpose, given how it is you're trying to narrate where you want to be, where you want to go, mm -hmm. how you want to become? And for me, both of them are trying to overcome the tragedy of viewing finitude as a life sentence, right? Mm -hmm. You're cursed into this 10 by 10 box for 80 years. Instead, I think both of them are inviting us to overcome nihilism, to overcome quietism, to abandon the Schopenhauerian pessimism, and instead to animate ourselves with passion, faith, will, intensity, enthusiasm, excitement, joy. Are we letting those things show up precisely because we recognize if I don't like what I'm doing today, not just in mundane senses, but like who I am, right? Am I living on purpose today? If I'm not, I need to change today because I am who I'm becoming, mm. which is Kierkegaard's point. Or Nietzsche's point, I have to become who I already am. And the problem is, if I don't like who I am, then becoming who I already am is a task that will always read to me as despairing. But oh, if yeah. instead I'm living into a self that I'm like, oh, hell yeah. Like I'm okay with this self. Mm. That doesn't mean that we don't have bad days. Doesn't mean that we don't mess it up. That's why the Ubermensch and the Night of Faith shouldn't be historical goals. They should be 
constant invitations to recognize we're never quite done so long as we exist.